This is the lecture for Chapter 18, Practical Applications of Immunology, Part 3. For this lecture, I'm going to continue talking about different diagnostic tests that are usually used for infectious diseases. And as you remember, when you are developing a diagnostic test for an infectious disease, you want to test for either the presence of the antigen, which indicates the presence of the microbe, or a test that indicates the presence of the antibodies, which will indicate an individual has been exposed to a microbe or possibly is immune to that microbe. And again, with these diagnostic tests, you want them to be highly specific so you can identify different strains of a microbe, identifying different antigens. So identifying that antigen as compared to this one, because that would indicate two different strains of the microbe. And if you are looking to determine if an individual is immune to a particular strain of a microbe, you want, would want to test their antibodies to see if they are antibodies to that particular antigen or the person is producing antibodies to another type of antigen. A very important tool in developing diagnostic tests for different types of diseases is the ability to produce monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal means that all the antibodies come from one B cell clone. So that means all the antibodies are identical, highly specific, and usually you can produce the antibodies in large quantities. You should know the process that is involved in developing monoclonal antibodies. So the first thing you need is the actual antigen, the actual protein that you wanna develop antibodies for. You take that protein, that antigen, inject it into a lab animal, a mouse. You allow that mouse to develop a primary response. Then you remove the B cells from the mouth, mouse, usually removing the spleen or the lymph nodes. Then you mix those B cells with cancerous cells and you identify the hybridoma cells, isolate them, isolate them, and then screen them to determine which one is producing the antibody you need. And the hybridoma that is producing the antibody that you want, you maintain those in cultures and you purify the antibodies and use the antibodies. In the previous lecture, I talked about two different types of diagnostic tests. One involved precipitation reactions and the other involved agglutination. In the tests, diagnostic tests I'm going to talk about in this lecture, they involve conjugated antibodies. Conjugated antibodies are antibodies that have had another molecule attached to the constant region of the heavy chain. So that is a conjugated antibody. And this type of molecule could be a radioactive molecule, it could be a fluorescent molecule, or it could be an enzyme. But often when you have a conjugated antibody, you call it a labeled antibody. Because usually this molecule that has been added to the constant region of the heavy chain allows you to identify the presence of the antibody. And the label is added to the constant region of the heavy chain because you would not want it added to the variable region of the heavy and light chain because that makes up the antigen binding site. So you still need the antigen binding site to be able to bind to the antigen so that you can have the antibody recognizing and binding to the antigen. One common type of conjugated antibody or labeled antibody are fluorescent antibodies. And fluorescent antibodies are labeled with a molecule that will fluoresce or glow. One application for fluorescent antibodies is to use in direct staining. And an example could be for a strep test for a patient. So for a patient, you suspect that this patient is infected with group A streptococci. 
that is the typical type of streptococcus that causes strep throat. So you take a swab from this patient's throat and then you add fluorescent antibodies that are specific for group A streptococci. So you add the fluorescent antibodies and in reality, the antibodies would have this fluorescent molecule on the bottom, not the whole antibody glowing. So you add the fluorescent antibodies to your smear of streptococcus and if this is group A streptococcus, the antibodies will bind. So the antibodies will bind to the bacteria. And again, this diagram isn't that great. The bacteria may in reality be relatively that size. The antibodies will be much smaller. But if the bacteria are group A streptococci, the antibodies will bind. And when you look at it under the microscope, you will see that the bacteria fluoresce. And that is a positive identification for group A strep. So one application of fluorescent antibodies is direct staining. A much more common application for fluorescent antibodies is in FACS. FACS stands for fluorescent activated cell sorting. And the fluorescent refers to the fact that you need to use fluorescent antibodies and the main purpose of FACS is cell sorting, to take a suspension of many different cells and to separate them out by type. And this is an example of a fax machine. And a fax machine does this process very efficiently and of course it's computerized. This is a diagram that explains what is occurring inside a fax machine, sometimes called a cell sorter. So again, the purpose of fax is to separate out different types of cells by type. So to start with, you will start with a sample of cells, a mixed group of cells, and to this you have added your antibody, which is specific for the one type of cell you are interested in. So that antibody will bind to the cells that you are interested in, and we refer to these as labeled cells. So once you have your suspension of cells, you've added the antibody, the antibody has bound to the cells that you're trying to identify, then you put that suspension into the fax machine. The fax machine is then calibrated so that it can drop one cell at a time. As each cell is dropped, the machine is going to shine a laser at the cell. And if the cell is fluorescing, if it has those fluorescent antibodies, the light from the laser will be scattered. Also, the machine has the fluorescence detector. So the fluorescence detector is going to de detect the fluorescence and the scatter. The last thing that the machine has are two magnetic plates. And as it runs electrical charges through the plates, it is able to move the cells to one side or the other. And at the very bottom, you have collection tubes. So the cells that were moved to one side will collect in one tube. The cells that were moved to the other side will collect in the other tube. One common application for fax machines is to help monitor the health of HIV positive individuals. HIV targets the CD4 cells, CD4 positive cells, which if you remember from your third line of defense, those are the T helper cells. So often when you have a person who is HIV positive, they talk about their CD4 count. They want to maintain their CD4 count to maintain their immunological health. So in order to count the number of CD4 cells that an individual has, they will draw blood from the individual. And in the blood, you have all sorts of white blood cells. You have neutrophils, you have some B cells, you have T cells, you have CTLs, and you have CD4 T helper cells. 
So in that sample of blood, they want to count how many CD4 positive cells that individual has. So what they will do is add the antibody that recognizes the CD4 molecule. So a fluorescent antibody that will bind to CD4. So all of these cells that are labeled will be the CD4 positive cells. The fax machine will drop the cells one at a time. The laser will determine if the cell is fluorescing or not. All the fluorescing cells will be gathered in one side and all the non-fluorescing cells will be gathered into the other tube. And then the machine is computerized so it can actually count how many cells are each in each tube and you get your CD4 count. Another application for this is in a bone marrow transplant. So with a bone marrow transplant, what you actually want to transplant are stem cells. And the stem cells are found in the bone marrow. And when you take a sample of bone marrow, you take all sorts of cells. You'll take stem cells, but you'll also take some immature B cells, immature T cells, mature B cells. So there are lots of different types of cells in the bone marrow but you only want to transfuse the stem cells. So they will take a sample of bone marrow from a donor and then they will add an antibody that will identify the stem cell. So in this case, the fluorescing cells are the stem cells. They will run it through the fax machine, go through the laser, go through the fluorescence detector, and then they will separate out all the fluorescing cells and these will be the stem cells and that's what they will use to transfuse into the recipient. Another application for fluorescent antibodies is a western blot and I've talked about a western blot before. So western blot this is a process to identify the presence of a protein so for this, you take your samples, so the protein extract, the antigen samples, they are run on electrophoresis and they are separated by size. Then you transfer that pattern to a blot, to a particular type of paper called a nitrocellulose paper. That is the blot and you do that because gels are fragile, difficult to deal with. Once you have transferred that pattern to the blot, then you add your probe. So this is your probe that is used in a Western blot, and it's an antibody which recognizes the particular protein you're looking for, but it is also conjugated to a fluorescent molecule. So you add this antibody to the paper. If your antigen is present, the antibody will bind and then often they can use film, x-ray film, and they look for a fluorescent, a glowing band. If you see that glowing band, then it means your protein was present in that sample. Another type of conjugated antibody is an enzyme linked antibody, and this is where the molecule that is attached to the constant region of the heavy chain is an enzyme. And when that enzyme catalyzes a reaction, that is what gives a positive result in the different types of tests. And often the reaction that the enzyme catalyzes is a color change. One practical application for enzyme linked antibodies are pregnancy tests. So the way the pregnancy test is arranged is that in the reaction site, you have antibodies that are specific for the hormone that is present during pregnancy, and they are conjugated to an enzyme. So when you add the sample, the urine sample, if the hormone is present, it will bind to those enzyme-linked antibodies. Then as the liquid, the urine moves by capillary action through the pregnancy test, those antibodies will be trapped by a fixed antibody 
and here is the substrate that will be broken down by the enzyme on the first antibody and cause a color change, which indicates a positive reaction. Another very common use for enzyme-linked antibodies are ELISAs, and ELISAs stand for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. And ELISAs are very, very commonly used to identify either the presence of an antigen or the presence of an antibody. And ELISAs are extremely sensitive. They can determine uh, levels of antigen or antibody at extremely low concentrations. And the other thing about ELISAs is that they are quantifiable. You can actually determine concentrations of antibody or antigen. There are many different ways to design ELISAs, but there are three basic types. The first type is a direct ELISA, and this is where the enzyme-linked antibody binds directly to the antigen. Once you have the enzyme-linked antibody binding to the antigen, then you add the substrate, and if this antibody is present, that will cause a reaction and it often turns color. Second type of ELISA is an indirect ELISA, and this is where the enzyme-linked antibody binds to an antibody which has recognized the antigen. And again, at the end, you add a substrate, and if the enzyme is present, the substrate will be converted into a product. The last type of ELISA is a sandwich ELISA. And this is often where you start with a capture antibody first, then you add the antigen, you add another secondary antibody to recognize the antigen, and then you add your enzyme-linked antibody that recognizes the second antibody. And of course, always at the end, you add the substrate, and if the enzyme is present, it will convert that substrate to a colored substance. So I want to go through a direct ELISA in more detail. Direct ELISAs are used to detect antigen in a sample. So an antigen, again, is any type of protein. So it can be used to detect a micro, a microbial antigen. It could be used to de detect a hormone. It could be used to detect cytokines be used to detect drugs, any type of protein that you find in a sample. The following is a procedure on how to perform a direct ELISA. And ELISA reactions occur in very small containers called wells. So for a direct ELISA, an ELISA that you are using to detect an antigen, you can start first with an antibody that recognizes that particular antigen. Once you have added the antibody to the well, then you add the patient sample. So you add the patient sample and you give it enough time for the antigen, if it's present, to be bound by the antibody. After you have added the patient sample, then you add the enzyme-linked antibody. So the enzyme-linked antibody is going to bind directly to the antigen. After you have added the enzyme-linked antibody, then you add the substrate. So you add the substrate, so if the enzyme is present, the enzyme will convert the substrate into the reactant or into the product, and that will cause a color change in the well. And this is an example of an ELISA plate. Each little circle here is one well. So each circle is a solution that's been tested for the presence of a particular antigen. And the blue color indicates a positive, and the clearish color would indicate a negative. So this is a positive, this is a negative. And I mentioned before that ELISAs can be quantitative. You can determine concentrations, and that is determined by the color intensity. So this, well, has a much 
higher concentration of the antigen than this well. And you can actually run this through a spectrophotometer and you can determine the actual concentrations of antigen in each well. The second type of ELISA I want you to know are indirect ELISAs. And indirect ELISAs are determining the presence of antibody in a sample. And this is the type of test they are doing when they are checking a person's titer. So sometimes you may have heard this in healthcare, especially for employees. If they want to determine if the employee needs a booster vaccine for a particular disease, they may want to check that person's titer. So what they are doing is running an indirect ELISA to determine the amount of antibodies that person has against that particular microbe. So to perform an indirect ELISA where you are looking at the presence of antibodies in the sample, you need to start with the antigen. So for the antigen, they absorb that to the bottom of the well first. Then they add the patient's serum, which may or may not have antibodies that recognize that antigen. Once they have added the patient's serum and allowed for time for the antibodies to bind to the antigen, then they add the enzyme-linked antibody that will recognize the target antibody after you've added the enzyme-linked antibody. The last reagent you would add is the substrate. So you add the substrate, and if the enzyme is present, it will convert the substrate into the product, which would cause a color change in the well. An indirect ELISA would be how they may test individuals to see if they have been exposed to the coronavirus and or if they are immune to the coronavirus. And I think I've heard in the media they refer to antibody tests. So what they would do is take coronavirus antigen and absorb it, put it on the bottom of the well. Probably the antigen would be from a spike because coronavirus is an enveloped virus. So they would have coronavirus spikes absorbed to the bottom of the well. Then they would add the patient's serum to see if any of the antibodies in the patient can bind to the coronavirus antigen. After they do that, they would add the enzyme-linked antibody, which would bind to the person's antibody. And then again, lastly, they would add the substrate, which could be converted into the product. And if the well turns a color, then that indicates this person has antibodies to coronavirus and is probably immune.